choices. We make them every day. Some are small and some are big. Left or right. Right or wrong. Lust or love. Gossip or truth. Deceit or honesty. Panic or prey. Worry or peace. Integrity or dishonesty. Your will or God's will. Who you are today for good or bad all comes down to the choices you have made along the way. The decisions we make affect our lives 10, 15, 20 years from now. A choice made today will affect our lives tomorrow. So choose wisely. Misty and I have uh, some friends, a married couple, and years ago they set out for this wedding. They hauled off across the country for this wedding in Indiana, and just as the sun, they were traveling at night, and just as the sun was peeking up over the horizon, they were staring straight at the Rocky Mountains. They had gone somehow, some way, somewhere, they made a wrong turn, and they drove seven hours all night long in the wrong direction and didn't realize it until the next morning. And she blamed him, of course, because she was sleeping. So she's like, you idiot, we missed the wedding. Like, there's no way we can go back the other direction now and make my family's wedding. So how many times in your life have you taken the wrong turn? How many times have you made a wrong decision and it ended up taking you to a place in life that you never wanted to go? This is going to be a good message, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be a good message. Our decisions that we make create consequences. Every time we make a decision, it determines the direction that our life takes. And if we make good choices, good things will almost always happen. Sometimes not. We're going to talk about that. And when we make bad decisions, ultimately bad things are going to happen. Sometimes we make bad, I'm not talking about what's wise, I'm talking about doing what's wrong and doing what's right. When we do what's wrong, sometimes it, you would convince yourself to think that it's paying off, but it only pays off for a season until our consequences catch up with our choices. But we have to come to a place in our life as believers, as followers, that, hey, we are going to do what's right all the time, no matter what, no matter what the consequences may, may come, we're going to do what's right. In public, in private, no matter who's looking, we're going to do what's right, not some of the time, but all of the time, every single time, big or small, right. we are going to do what's right. right. I like saying it this way. If you always do what's right, you'll never go wrong. If you always, right. always, 100% of the time, do what's right, you will never go wrong. How many of you guys would say, I want to never go wrong in my life. I don't ever want to go wrong. Then do what's right. All right, close your Bibles. We're going home. That's the message. That's it. That's it. Always do what's right. Today, we're going to be talking about standing for what's right. We're going to be talking about a lot of things in this series about things that, that are worthy of fighting for, things that we should stand for. And today, we're going to talk about standing for what is right. We want to start by introducing you to a guy by the name of Daniel. Daniel was known for doing what was right. He was known for his character. And here's what happened. I'm going to give you a little background about Daniel if you don't know who he is. He was an Israelite. He was living in Jerusalem. He was highly educated. He was a young man. But Israel was taken over by ancient Babylon, okay? So the king comes in, Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes over the land, wipes everything out. But he chooses to take some things with him. He takes some, some holy uh, vessels, some instruments from the temple. He also takes some people. He chooses to take Daniel and a few other young men, among others, I would imagine, that 
he thought in his mind could prove to be helpful somewhere along the way. So he took Daniel and he took these other guys and some others and, and he took them in and basically put them into a training program so that they could serve his kingdom. And so they went into this program and as part of the program, a lot of things happened where they had to take on rituals. Uh, they had to take on um, a lifestyle that they were not accustomed to. He was basically converting them to become just like the Babylonians, all right? So they became a part of this Persian empire, and they were taking on all their culture and all their traditions. So once they go through this training, they realize very quickly that one of the things that they were going to have to change was the way that they ate. And you're thinking, what's the big deal with that? Because, listen, guys, they were chowing down on good stuff. All right, we're talking like uh, red lobster, you know, butter, butter lobster, uh, crab. What are those? What are those rolls? I eat. Like, I always tell the waiter. I say always like we eat there a lot. We don't, but special occasions, red lobster has those cheesy biscuits. Oh my word! <laughs> you might be gluten free until you get one of those cheesy biscuits and then you have to just give up like, that you know, day special occasions we'll go there somebody gives us a gift card we'll, we'll do that <laughs> that's a special occasion when somebody gives us a gift yeah hit, hit. that was not a plug I'm not asking you to give us a actually, gift card actually Brad's dad but always buys dad, him a gift knows, card to Red Lobster for his birthday heart, and so we so, go on your birthday you know Mr. Big Buck's off strolling there and say hey you want a big tip <laughs> keep the rolls coming just keep those biscuits coming <laughs> I'll eat them always, right? And they treat us right. They usually send a little doggy bag with those biscuits, right? There. Oh, my. Yeah, doggy biscuits. Anyway, so for Pastor Brad. So, you know, they were chowing down on these bacon cheeseburgers in Babylon and these crab cakes and these cheddar biscuits. They were eating all this good stuff. But here's the problem. You see, if you know anybody that, that, that is Jewish today and they follow Jewish custom, then they follow what we call the Levitical law. So there's a different, there's a different um, diet that they follow according to the Old Testament. You look back in, in Leviticus and you can find out how God established this way of eating for them because he wanted them to be set apart. He wanted them to be different than everybody else. Well, Daniel was like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't eat the food that they're putting before me like this bacon and stuff. I can't do the shrimp and all this because this, is, this goes against what God has told us as far as how we're supposed to eat. So he, so he went to, and God gave him favor with the uh, administrators that were over uh, the king's palace and all that. And he said, hey, look, um, I can't eat this food. But let's, let's make a deal. If you'll let us eat, like, basically vegetables and water over these next, you know, however many days, uh, we'll, we'll show you that, that everything's going to be okay. And he said, listen, just because of the favor that God laid on his life, he said, all right, well, we're going to try this for, for a short time. And if I see anything change in, in the way, in your appearance and the way you look, then the king's going to have my head and we can't have that. So uh, if, if all goes well, we'll talk some more about this, this eating plan, all right? So they let him do it. Let them do it. And so they, they, they just ate vegetables and drank water. And believe it or not, God blessed them and they were healthy. But not only that, that gave them time to, to prove themselves also that they were full of wisdom that God had downloaded in them. And, and the king realized very quickly that these Israelites, these guys were on it. I mean, they were so intelligent. They were full of wisdom and, and high counsel. And so God began to use them and God began to bless them through it. So after a period of time, uh, God continued to bless them because over and over and over they did what was right. And eventually God promoted Daniel all the way up to where he was second in command over all the kingdom. Sounds a lot like Joseph, if you know that story as well. He ended up being over all the governors over the entire land in Babylon. We're talking about a slave that was exiled from a different country. God raised him up to a high position of responsibility. Why? I'm going to tell you why. I'm glad you asked. Because Daniel was all about doing what was right in the eyes of God. He always did what was right in the eyes of God. And because he did what was right in the eyes of God, God blessed him for his obedience. God blessed him for fighting for and standing for what was right. Okay, so that was just the introduction. So now, if you have your Bible, we're going to go to the chapter 6 in Daniel. And this is where we're going to pick up because this is where, at this point, man, God's favor is all over his life. And guess what happens? Sometimes other people become jealous 
when God's favor is all over your life. They can't understand. You don't deserve the promotion you just got, but you got it because God's favor is all over your life. They don't understand why God is blessing you because they aren't being blessed and it's because they aren't doing what's right. Well, these guys, this is exactly what happens in this nation. Of course, remember, Daniel is a slave, so he's hated even more. So Daniel chapter six, we're going to pick it up in verse one. And it says this, Darius the Mede. Let me stop right there before I go on. At this point, it is a little bit. You need to read the whole book. It's awesome. At this point, Daniel has served two kings. All right. They both have passed away. This is the third ruler, which tells you he's doing something right. He's still serving in the kingdom. He's still alive. This, and he's still alive <laughs> as a slave. This is King Darius. All right. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. This at this point in time, guys, they have taken over almost all of the Middle East. All right. This is where we're talking. Okay. So Babylon has taken over almost everything in the Middle East at this point. So they divided into 120 provinces and he appointed high officers to rule over each province. Okay. So kind of follow the structure of the government. The king also chose Daniel and two other administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators, there were two others, and the high officers. There was 120 of them. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Follow me. The entire empire empire. The plan is King Darius is obviously talking to some guys and he's like, Hey, have you seen Daniel? Do you realize this guy, the slave boy that we brought over, not only is he wise, not only can he interpret dreams, he has our best interest at heart. He's not undermining us. He's not trying to come alongside of anybody else and like overthrow the government. He is amazing. I'm going to make him over the entire empire. What do you think happens with everybody else? Jealousy begins to rise. So verse four, then the other administrators, there were two, remember? And the 120 high officers, they began searching for some fault. We got to find some dirt on this dude, Daniel. As he was handling the government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. Pause. Could anybody say that about us? Could they say that about you? I can't find anything to criticize or condemn other than God's favors all over them and it's making me sick. That's where these dudes were. They said this, he was always faithful, always responsible and completely trustworthy. He always did what was right. Verse five. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Now, before I tell you the rest of this story, let me stop and tell you this. Obviously, Daniel is serving the one true God, the God of Israel. The Babylonians had their own statues and their own gods, and they were all false gods. Daniel did not go into this new land and hide his relationship with God. He stood firm, not only in all the affairs of the government, but more importantly, in his own walk with God. He didn't hide it. He didn't try to be fake. He didn't say, hey, when I go home in my little closet, I'll pray. No, 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 no. He prayed three times a day. He'd swing wide open the doors of his window and he would look towards Jerusalem and he would pray and people would see him and he didn't care. All right. So this tells us, obviously, they knew about Daniel's religion. They knew Daniel had a relationship and they said, the only thing we can get him on is if we can like somehow get a law in place that would go against his religion, we know he won't go against it. Guess why? He had proven he would stand. So guess what they did? They go into King Darius and they play on his pride and they say, King Darius, we have a fantastic idea. For the next 30 days, we think you should put a law into place that says no one can pray to anybody but your majesty. He's like, oh, it's a great plan. Yes. And they said this, they lied. They said all the administrators, that was three, Daniel and two others, all the administrators and all the high officers, we all agree. Obviously, that was a lie. They were doing what was wrong. Daniel had no part of this. So they said, if anybody breaks the law in 30 days and they pray to anyone other than you, your majesty, they should be thrown into the lion's den. 
He says, that's a great idea. Draw it up. So they draw it up and they bring the papers and they put them in front of him and he signs it and he seals it with his ring and it's a done deal. And they were like, we got him. Just mosey on over to Daniel's house about evening time and you'll see him swing wide open those windows because we've watched him do it every single day since this Jewish boy showed up as a teenager every day, three times a day, morning, noon, and night. This boy goes in and takes every break. He takes every lunch break, every dinner break, swings wide open those doors and he prays and cries out to his God. So sure enough, they go to his house. There he is praying. They're like, all right, back to the king they go. King Darius, Daniel, that Jewish boy, that Hebrew slave, he has now broke the new law. Well, Darius realizes at that moment, I'm an idiot. He loves Daniel, but he realizes these guys, because of their jealousy, set him up. And the Bible says that he spent all day trying to figure out, was there a way around throwing Daniel into the lion's den? Was there any way out of the law he had put into motion. But at that day and time, even the king could not change the law. So at the end of the day, they said, stop Stalin. You know Daniel's wrong. You know he broke the law. And he said, go take Daniel to the lion's den. The king met him there at the mouth, at the opening where they were getting ready to launch him in. And he said, Daniel, I pray that your God will save you from the mouths of the lion. They, put, they threw him in. They put the rock over the top of it. And that night, the Bible says that King Darius went home and he wouldn't eat. He fasted all night and he prayed to Daniel's God. And he said, the God of Daniel, I pray that you would save him from the mouths of the lion. You see, King Darius knew Daniel hadn't done anything wrong. Daniel had stood for what was right always, no matter what. So the next morning, he runs down and they pull back that boulder off the top of that lion's den, and he cries out, Daniel, Daniel, son, has your God saved you? And Daniel yells back, and he says, my God has shut the mouths of the lions. Don't you know that everybody else about passed out at that very moment? The king went to celebrating. He said, pull him out of there. They got him out of there, and he said, go get all the administrators and all the high officials and everyone who set this boy up and get their families, their wives and their children, and you better marry a man who can stand for God because the women and the children were thrown, all of them, in to the lion's den. And the Bible says that before their feet hit the ground, the lions devoured them. See, they didn't feed those guys. What they ate was flesh when it was humans tossed in. These guys were hungry, but God had supernaturally shut their mouths. Why? Because Daniel stood for what was right. And because of it, God was going to use his life as an example, just like he will each and every one of us. You see, Daniel had made a decision to live a life of no compromise. This is a word, this is a phrase I want you to get in your mind. No compromise. No compromise. No matter what. I will not compromise. I will not go against God's standard. I will not go against God's word. No compromise. I would rather lose my life than to displease my God. And so because of it, God's favor was poured out upon Daniel in the eyes of man. So you have to ask yourself, what in the world would cause this boy to be like this? I mean, it begs for that answer. And there's only one explanation, and that is Daniel had a real relationship with Almighty God. It wasn't superficial. It wasn't about religion, even though he lived under the old law. And he had that whole ritual of how they ate and, and the sacrifices. He had all of that. But it wasn't about the religion. It wasn't about the to-do list or the not-to-do list. You see, he didn't grumble and complain when he had to eat veggies only. How would you like it if God said, hey, boys and girls, I want you for the next three years, because that's how long it ended up being. Three years, veggies and water. Some of us would get in shape, right? We'd be like, I'm going to like shrink down to nothing. But Daniel didn't. Why? Because God honored him in that. And Daniel didn't complain. All because of his relationship with God. See, he had predetermined in his mind, no matter what happens to me, I'll always do what's right and I'll leave the results up to God. 
So there's four things that we want to bring to your attention, four lessons about the life of Daniel. If you're taking notes, these would be really, really good things to write down. Lesson number one is stand firm in your faith and honor God in every single decision. I want to read that again. Stand firm in your faith and honor God in every single decision. You know what that's about? That's, that's about believing that God is in those instances when you have to stand for what's right, there's going to be consequences for standing for what's right. But you need to believe in those moments that God is either going to give you a way of escape, that he's going to allow you a way out of that situation, or he's going to give you the strength to endure. You know, you might be uh, facing a decision at work. Maybe somebody at work, maybe it's your boss, is asking you to do something that is wrong. Maybe they're asking you to lie. Maybe they're asking you to falsify information. When you stand up and do what's right, you know, the consequences might be that you get fired. But don't you know, <laughs> Don't you know that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory? Amen. He will take care of you. He will honor you. If you, if you do what's right, God will promote you. Because I'd rather have the provision and the protection of God any day of my life than to depend and lean on somebody else providing a job for me. Always do what's right. Be faithful. Stand up for what's right. And God is going to bless you. That's right. So number two is this. Refuse. Refuse to compromise godly standards. You know, the Bible says, I love this verse. I didn't love it so much as a kid because my dad used to read this one to me and I was like, can we not just skip some of this stuff? I mean, really, can we not just like pick the good stuff and highlight it, the, the blessings and the favor? But dad used to tell me this scripture and it was James four seventeen. and it says this. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. If I know what I'm supposed to do and I don't do it, I don't do the right thing, for me, it's sin. And in any walk of life, whether you're a kid in school, you know, I remember being in school and people saying, hey, I want to basically cheat off of you. But they didn't say cheat. They were like, hey, can I just look at your answers? Yeah, no. I wasn't cheating. So in your mind, you'd think, well, I didn't cheat. I just let them look off of me. It's still the same thing. You're doing what's wrong. It goes against God's standard. I remember a few years ago when Brad and I, we were working at a corporation and we were pastoring and working full time as well. And I remember at one moment I had to go with the vice president of the company and I was going to have to go to the bank and they were putting my name on the bank account. And so he said, hey, I'll meet you at the office at nine. We'll jump in the truck. We'll go. Okay. Well, Brad and I, from the day we got married, had made a decision. We will never ride in a vehicle with a person of the opposite sex, we will not do it. Not for work, not for pleasure, nothing. Why? Because we didn't want anybody on looking to think that we're with someone else. Second, we're going to avoid the very temptation, all right? So we were putting guards around our marriage. So this guy's in his 70s, okay? So it's really easy in my mind to start going, obviously, it's like my grandpa. It's no big deal. But I had already predetermined. 17 years earlier, I will never ride in a vehicle with a person of the opposite sex that wasn't my brother or someone, okay? And so I told Brad, I was like, man, I'm supposed to go with him in the morning. You know what? I'm just going to tell him. Like, I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I'm just going to tell him I'll drive myself. So I was like, hey, tomorrow you don't need to come all the way down here and pick me up. Like, I'll just meet you there that I'm going to run some errands. I didn't hurt his feelings. I didn't make a big deal about it, but I also did what was right between my husband and me and God. Because there's going to be times in your life where God personally tells you something, where he begins to speak to you. I remember as a 16-year-old, God spoke to me and said, I want you one year to listen to nothing but Christian music. One year it was like a turning point in my life, in my relationship. I played having religion in my life from the time I was born. One year, nothing but Christian music. And there were lots of times I got in, I love all kinds of music, and I wanted to turn my station. I wanted to turn it to something else. It would have been wrong for me, because God had told me, may not be wrong for anybody else, but for me, he told me, one year, Misty, nothing but Christian music. Well, you know what that did for me? It got all the other junk out of my mind. Now, to this day, I love all kinds of music, but it, then God was like detoxing my brain. 
He was like trying to get all the junk out of my brain because when I would wake up in the morning, I wasn't singing worship. I was singing some pop rock song I'd been listening to the night before. He needed to detox my brain. I had to make a decision. I am not going to compromise God's standards. I'm going to do what's right no matter how bad it hurts. So lesson number three is live faithfully and seek to have an excellent spirit. Live faithfully and seek to have an excellent spirit. You know what that means? It means never give up, never lose heart, never lose hope, doing what's right. And don't complain. And don't complain about it. And have a good attitude doing it. Yeah, because honestly, you, you kind of, it, 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 you miss the whole point when there's an undertone of attitude happening while you're trying to do what's right. right. It's, like, it's like fasting. You know, we just came out of this three-day fast. It's like spending three days complaining about how hungry you are instead of... <laughs> did, I, did I strike a chord with somebody? <laughs> it's to, instead, of, instead of focusing on the Father and spending that time engaged in prayer and asking God to grow you, we're complaining about our circumstances and how we feel and how hungry we are. And so why in the world would our pastors ask us to fast for three why days? Why would they do that? ask us to starve ourselves. Well, you're starving yourselves if it's not coupled with prayer and the power of God's presence. But listen, be faithful in doing what's right. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't give up and have a good attitude while it's happening. God will bless you. All right. All right. Number four is this. Serve God continually and seek to be a living witness of his power and his faithfulness. When you realize that there are onlookers all over, Daniel, everybody was watching him. There was only a few who were with him who believed like he believed. He was in a land where everybody did not believe in his God. But because he was an incredible witness of God's power, do you know that the entire nation was changed? Do you know that after he was brought out of the lion's den, that King Darius made a decree that no one was to pray to anyone now but the God of Daniel. Because Daniel would not compromise, because Daniel was faithful in his witness, the power of God was evident in his life. It changed an entire nation. One man. And you think to yourself, come on, seriously, that's a Bible character. Like, God is never going to do that with me. Really? I think he would. Daniel 9, 2 through 3 says this, Daniel learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem lied desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and I pleaded with prayer and with fasting. This verse tells us why Daniel's relationship with God was what it was and why he's able to stand. You notice in here it says, you go back one, I looked up for a second. There you go, look at the first part. He said, I learned from reading the word of the Lord. The only way you're going to know God's standards is if you know God's heart. The only way you're going to know God's heart is if you get into God's word. This is his book. He wrote it. It's his story. You learn what he cares about. You learn how to please him by getting into his word. And the second thing Daniel did is it says that he prayed and he fasted. Those are the three things coupled together that made Daniel so strong. Because he was just like us, guys. He was flesh and blood. There was no power in him other than the power of God at work in his life. And because he was willing to submit himself daily to the reading of God's word and to prayer and to fasting as a part of his life, he had such a strong relationship with God that it gave him courage and boldness to stand. When everybody else was doing what was wrong, Daniel still was doing what was right. And that's what God wants each of us to do. That's right. How many of you guys would say, I want God to watch over my life continually. And when I pray, I want him to hear me. I want him to respond and answer my prayers. How many of you guys would say that? I want God to watch over my life. I want him to hear my prayers. Let's look at this scripture today as we're closing. 1 Peter 3, 10, uh, 10 through 12. It says this, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good or do what's right. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Here's the promise, guys. The eyes of the Lord will watch over you for doing what is right. And his eyes are open to your prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Guys, think about it. We are inundated all the time with opportunities. We, we 
pay or receive money under the table. We can cheat on our taxes. You can drive without insurance. The, the list goes on and on and on. You can, you can change information uh, at work or at home, uh, fi financially. There, there are opportunities constantly to do what's wrong, to cheat, to lie, to steal, work the time clock, mm -hmm, right? All the time. All the time, there's opportunities. Two reasons that you want to do what's right. You want to honor God, and you want people to trust your witness. People are watching you. God is watching you because he wants to bless you. He's looking. All right, is he going to do what's right? Is he, no one's looking. Is he going to do what's right? He wants to bless you. Other people are watching. I know they go to Mountain Movers. I'm just watching. <laughs> Just watch it. See if they're going to do what's right. Because they're already questioning God. You may be the only evidence of his existence in their life. Your habits, your attitude, your conduct, your character. You may be the only chance they have, the only hope they have of accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their Lord. Always do what's right. You will never go wrong. Would you bow your heads? Father, I pray today that you would stir our hearts for integrity. <laughs> I pray, God, that you would quicken our hearts, Lord, to, to hate evil. Make us sick for doing what's wrong. I pray, Lord, I just feel right now, Lord, there may be people in this room right now, and they, they have made a wrong decision, and they knew it was wrong. And it's, it's sitting on their chest right now. I pray, Lord, that these individuals would make it right, no matter what the consequences. But I might lose my job, Pastor. Do it. Do what's right. But when my wife finds out what I've done, do what's right. Make it right. Come on. God, touch our hearts today. Cleanse us from evil. Give us a steadfast, a permanent desire, a drive to always please you in everything that we say, everything we think, everything that we do. God, drive us towards a place of continual character. Let us always do what's right. God, we know that you will watch over us. Your eyes will be open to us as we pray to you, God. You will receive us. You will bless us. You will promote us like you did Daniel with more grace and more mercy to be who you've called us to be, to do what you've called us to do. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'd like to know if there's anyone in this room that you would say, Pastor, I, I want Jesus as my Savior and my friend. I want a real relationship with him. I want to make heaven my home. If that's you and you don't want to leave this place today without making that decision, the best decision you've ever made in your life. We're talking about doing the right thing. This is the right thing to do. Call upon Jesus to fill your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins like I did many years ago. Let him cleanse you and make you new. If that's you today, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to know who you are. Would you just raise your hand right now and just show me who you are and we're going to pray with you in this place. Father God, Church, can we pray this prayer together? Would you pray with me? Father, I love you. Father, I love Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Forgive me Forgive for doing me. what was wrong. For doing what was wrong. Forgive me for displeasing you. Forgive me for displeasing Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart. Make me new. Make me new. I call upon Jesus. I call upon Jesus. To live inside of me. To live inside of me. I confess me. him as Lord of my life. I confess him as Lord of my Never life. Never to be the same again. Never to be the same In again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen, amen. Amen. If you amen. just made that decision, it's the greatest decision of your life. And we have a gift for you to celebrate. It's called your next step kit. You can pick it up on the left as you leave today. And I just want to tell you, and I'm going to tell all of them today. Last Sunday morning, we saw eight people come to Christ. And that's why we do what we do. Seven was in-house between the three services and one was even online. We are watching God work even through our online. So will you give a hand to those who just made that decision one more time? Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook.
If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.